Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Science and the Quran. In this series of episodes, inshallah, we would like to study the special theory of relativity by Albert Einstein and use our knowledge to make some reflections about some verses in the Quran. Now, I'm not trying in any way to claim that the Quran laid out the special theory of relativity, otherwise it would have been discovered in the year 600 and not in the year 1905. What I am claiming, though, which has been the theme of our episode so far and all of our episodes henceforth, inshallah, is that the more we understand about the universe, the richer and deeper will be our appreciation of the so-called scientific verses in the Quran and of many verses that we never consider to be scientific. So why is this topic important anyway? I think it's very important even if we were not to reflect on the verses of the Quran at all. Because as Muslims who are interested in nature, who are interested in how the universe works, the special theory of relativity was a turning point in human conception and understanding of our universe. It is really not an overstatement to say that up until then it represented the single most radical shift in the way we understand things. And I'll go back to a quote that I've used before from Professor Brian Greene in Fabric of the Cosmos. Quote, the overarching lesson that has emerged from scientific inquiry over the last century is that human experience is often a misleading guide to the true nature of reality. Lying just beneath the surface of the everyday is a world we'd hardly recognize. And I'd like to reflect this on the Quranic verse from Surah Al-Rum, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون They know but the outer surface of this world's life, whereas of the ultimate things they are utterly unaware. And when we study the special theory of relativity, we come to realize that indeed our common sense, our everyday experience, represents just a surface layer of reality, and that just beneath that surface layer of the way we think the world is, is a much deeper and much richer reality, a world that indeed we would hardly recognize and hardly believe. That alone makes the special theory of relativity worth studying, even if we were not to look at any other verses of the Qur'an. We will, of course, look at several verses of the Qur'an in light of Einstein's work, but to be able to do that, we will need to gain some understanding of the special theory of relativity, as if we are simply studying physics. And I don't want that to turn anyone off. I am assuming that the reason you are here listening is because you have a genuine and deep interest in science. And just like the sorcerers of Musa had to spend years and years studying magic so that when the miracle came before them, they were the ones able to appreciate it, we need to put in some time studying science so that we can then turn around and take this knowledge and apply it to verses of the Qur'an. So for the next couple of episodes at least, this is going to seem like a physics lesson, and I hope that you are happy about that and not turned off by it. This revolution in human understanding is truly remarkable. One of the remarkable things about it is that Einstein did it in his spare time, if you will. He was 26 years old, a patent clerk third class in a Swiss patent office, interested in science and thinking about the way the universe worked. And in 1905, he published three papers in the journal Annalen der Physik. And one of those papers laid out his special theory of relativity. 
And Einstein believed what Galileo and Newton had believed before him, which is that the laws of physics are identical to all observers in an inertial reference frame. What does that mean? It means that there's really no such thing as absolute rest or absolute motion. If we take a look at people at rest and people moving with a constant velocity, there really is no distinction there. Another way to look at it is that if I am on the surface of, if I am inside a train moving along the surface of the earth at a steady velocity of 10 miles an hour, I can legitimately say that I am standing still and everyone else is moving past me in the other direction at 10 miles per hour. We don't normally do that, of course, because we use the earth as a reference frame. But each of us has probably had an experience sitting on a train carriage or in a car, and all of a sudden we see some motion and momentarily we're confused. Am I the one who's moving forward or is the other person moving backward? Alternatively, if you've ever had the experience of being on an airplane and you fall asleep and you wake up and the airplane is moving at a nice constant velocity with no turbulence, it almost feels as if you're standing still. And in fact, what the theory of relativity says, and this is due to Galileo and Newton much before Einstein, is that the laws of physics are exactly identical whether you're standing still or moving at a constant velocity. So that if the windows on the plane are closed and I can't look outside and see myself moving, I have no way to tell, am I moving at... 300 miles per hour at a steady velocity or 600 miles per hour at a steady velocity or even floating suspended in midair if that were possible. If I tried to juggle, it would be the same moving at a steady velocity uh, on the plane as if I were sitting on the tarmac. If I try to pour a cup of water, it pours the same way. If we clear the plane and play catch or play ping pong, all of the laws of physics of the balls I juggle or the water I pour or the paddles and the ball in ping pong would be identical. I don't have to make some special adjustment in my juggling or in my pouring the water because I am on a plane moving at a steady velocity. Now, of course, if a plane is not moving at a steady velocity, that's a different story, but we're talking just about inertial reference frames. So, this was the understanding of Galileo and of Newton. And Einstein agreed with that entirely. So where is the issue then? The issue comes in if we look at the following. So let's look at how we see the world. And this is how Galileo and Newton saw the world that let's say I am standing here on the platform and next to me there's a moving train moving to the right. So if I am just standing still and there's a guy in the train and I can see him and he throws a ball. So according to me, the speed of the ball is the speed of the train plus the speed of the ball's release according to the guy on the train. So let's say, for example, the train is moving at a speed V of 10 meters per second. Somebody on the train throws a ball, which according to him, relative to him, is moving at a speed U of 15 meters per second. Then, according to me, that ball moves at U plus V, or 25 meters per second. And that's easy to understand. I think we all understand that entirely well. If the guy just held the ball in his hand, then, according to me, the ball would move at 10 meters per second because the ball, his hand, him, the entire train is moving at 10 meters per second. When he gives it some extra speed by throwing it, then, if he were standing still not and the train were not moving, he would throw it. It would be 15 meters per second. The train is carrying him at 10, he throws it at another 15, that gives me a total of 25. Alternatively, let's say I am stationary on a street corner. 
and I watch a car speed by me at 50 miles per hour. Relative to me on the street corner, it's moving at 50 miles per hour. But let's say you are driving another car behind that first one at 40 miles per hour. Then you measure that first car speed and according to you, it's 10 miles per hour. Because if you consider yourself being still, that car is moving just 10 miles per hour faster than you. And so for us, all of that is ordinary and natural, and that is precisely how the world works, and we have no problem with that. So where was the revolution then? That, inshallah, will be the topic of our next episode.